Hello, this lecture is on section 4.5 in the Lock 5 textbook, and this section is all about drawing connections. So after reading this section in the textbook, you should understand the relationship between the bootstrap and the randomization distributions, understand the relationship between confidence intervals and, a, and hypothesis testing, and you should be able to generate a randomization distribution, or at least understand how or, and why they are created the way they are. So let's begin by reviewing bootstrapping and randomization distributions. To construct confidence intervals for parameters, what we're going to do if we have just a, uh, one sample is we're going to take that original sample and we're going to take a sample from that with a replacement of the original sample size. We're going to calculate our sample statistic of interest and then we're going to create, we're going to repeat this process, I should say, you know, 10,000 times. And this is going to get a, give us a bootstrap distribution. So we're going to, uh, within this bootstrap distribution, be able to come up with a range of plausible values for our population parameter. And the reason that we can do this, right, is that we know that our sample, or assuming that our sample is a random sample, we can assume it's representative of our population, and that's why we can do this. So the bootstrap gives us a range of plausible values for the parameter. Now, if we wanted to assess the likelihood of observing our sample statistic, and we wanted to understand it by uh, the likelihood of observing it just by chance alone, in other words, if we were to assume that the null hypothesis is true, what we can do is we can construct a randomization distribution. <clears throat> right? So we construct this distribution, the sampling distribution, given that the null hypothesis is true. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into this randomization distribution. We're going to look for the location of our sample statistic. If our, look, if our um, sample statistic occurs infrequently, then we're going to say that uh, we will end up rejecting the null hypothesis because our p-value will be very small and we'll have support for the alternative. Now, what's important is that we need to, when we're doing the randomization distributions, we need to set up our null because we need to know what that null hypothesis value is in order to actually create a randomization distribution. And then we need to know what our alternative is in order for us to determine what is more extreme. So let's just quickly review these three different ideas. Um, three different ideas. Sampling distribution, bootstrap distribution, randomization distribution. And just for, for fun, I would encourage you to think about a sample and a population. So a sampling distribution shows us the distribution of sample statistics from a population. And it is generally centered at the population parameter. So it gives us a sense of how much variability we expect from our sample statistics for a given population, and it should be centered at the population parameter. Now bootstrapping is our way to approximate the sampling distribution. So it simulates a distribution of sample statistics from the population, but it's centered at the original sample statistic, not at the population parameter. And we've talked about why this is the case. Effectively, what bootstrapping does is it treats your sample statistic as though it's the population parameter, which is why it ends up being centered at the original sample statistic. And so the bootstrap gives us a range of plausible values for our population parameter. A sampling distribution tells us the range in sample statistics we can expect for a given population parameter. The randomization distribution st simulates a distribution of sample statistics for a population when the null hypothesis is true, and it's generally centered at the null parameter, so our null hypothesis parameter value. So this is also a sampling distribution, and it's a sampling distribution for a specific parameter, and then that parameter is the null hypothesis value. So maybe it's a proportion that's equal to 0.5, and so if we create a randomization distribution, that randomization distribution will be centered at that null hypothesis value of 
And we've talked about how you could use a coin, for example, to create a randomization distribution. So these are three really key and important ideas. And once we move out of this section, we're gonna, to some extent, say goodbye to bootstrapping and randomization distributions, um, because what we're going to be doing is looking into formula-based approaches to um, creating confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, which means we no longer need bootstrapping or randomization distributions. Now I want to remind you that there's also sort of added within these three ideas is this idea of a sample and a population and that a sample is going to be the cases or units that we've actually collected data on and the population is all the cases or units that we're interested in. So these three distributions within that box are all grouped together because they correspond to sample statistics and you get standard errors and then a sample and a population are not about sample statistics, they're about cases and units, and you get standard deviations. So you've maybe already drawn this connection, um, and if you haven't, this is such a strong and powerful connection to be able to draw. And this is the connection between a confidence interval and hypothesis testing. So if the value of our null hypothesis value is not within a 95% confidence interval, then it's not plausible for the value, uh, then it is not it's not a plausible value, excuse me, for the parameter, right? So if the null hypothesis value is not in our 95% confidence interval, that means it's implausible, it's not a plausible value, which means that we would reject the null hypothesis for alpha equals 0.05 if we were doing a two-tailed test. Similarly, if the value of the null hypothesis is in the 95% confidence interval, then it means it is a plausible value for our parameter, and we would fail to reject the null hypothesis for alpha equals 0.05 for a two-tailed test. You can extend this as well. So if we were to think about a 99% confidence interval, that if the H0, and let's just say we've got this distribution that looks like this, Let's say that this is that these values in the middle here correspond to the to like let's let's say we've done a bootstrap. So these are the ninety we create then our ninety nine percent confidence interval. So if our null hypothesis value is like right here, that would mean that if we did a test with alpha equals to point zero one because it's going to be um, 0 0.01, 99%. If you add those two together, if you convert that 0.01 to a percent, it's 1%. It's going to sum up to 100. Same thing with the 95% and the 0 0.05. This would mean that we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. However, if our value for the, the H0 was right here, instead, that means we would reject it. And you can look at that for 90% confidence intervals, 85% confidence intervals, or any of those sorts of things. So really, the 95% the confidence interval gives us really a range of values that we could sort of do this hypothesis testing for. In a sense, any value that falls inside of this range, if you were to do a hypothesis test for, you would expect alpha to be greater than, I mean, not alpha, excuse me, you would expect the p-value to be greater than whatever your alpha is. Whereas if you're doing this interval like this and you are testing a value that's outside, then you know your value is always going to be less than alpha. And so in a sense, you can consider confidence intervals as kind of doing a lot of different tests. So let's look at an example. We're gonna look at a recent survey and this is asking about Trump's handling of COVID-19. So a recent Economist YouGov uh, poll asked 1,333 likely voters, do you approve or disapprove of the way Donald Trump has handled COVID-19? The proportion who approved was 0.39 or 520 likely voters. Is there evidence that Trump's approval rating on COVID-19 is different than 50%? How can we answer this with a question? How can we answer this question um, using a 95% confidence interval? How can we answer this question using a hypothesis test? 
Well, if we wanted to use a confidence interval, right? Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to create a a, um, a bootstrap. Let me turn that back to red. We'll have a bootstrap. Okay, we know it's going to be centered at approximately a 0.39 because that's what our sample statistic is. And then we create our 95% confidence interval, maybe it cuts it off like this. And so what we're looking for is, is this value 0.5, is that in here? Or is it out here in the tail? If it's in the tail, then that means we reject H0. If it's in the middle, it means we don't reject H0. In other words, it means that if it was in here, in the center here in the middle where we don't reject the null hypothesis, this means that we would conclude it is a plausible value. If it's in the tail, that means we would conclude that it's an implausible value. It's a not plausible value, right? Now, how might we answer this with a hypothesis test? So it's pretty similar kind of an idea. Maybe we'll create a randomization distribution. This will be centered at 0.5. And what we're going to look for here is that 0.39. So let's say the 0.39 is like right here. Okay. Now we're doing a two-tailed test. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking to see if this area multiplied by 2. And because of symmetry, something that I really haven't talked about so much this, uh, this semester, is that this area and this area over here are going to be the same. So it's those two areas added together is the same as this area right here uh, multiplied by 2. Okay. So if these two areas added together are greater than 0 0.05, that means we know we are in here. If these two areas added together are less than 0 0.05, that means we know we're in a tail. So really, we could answer this using either approach. The, the reason maybe to use a hypothesis test is if we want to really understand how unlikely it would be to occur. But I would argue most of the cases, what we really want are plausible values for parameters. And I think confidence intervals are in general a better approach when it makes sense. So I would encourage you, if you're trying to decide between a confidence interval or a hypothesis test to answer a research question, first I would just see, well, is it asking me about a test or is it just asking about a plausible ra range of values? Um, and then that will help to differentiate that. But if you're just trying to decide how to do this in your own work, your own research, confidence intervals are a better idea, even though they're harder to come around uh, understand because you're coming up with a range of plausible values rather than just testing a specific value. So now we're going to switch gears. We're going to quickly talk about randomization distributions. Now, section 4.5 does a great job of explaining how you can create randomization distributions for a variety of different uh, sample statistics. And I would encourage you to carefully read through it. Some of the activities that we'll be working on in class will ask you about creating randomization distributions. And we've already talked a little bit about how you could do it um, in the case of a single proportion. But when we, when we want to create a randomization distribution, we really want it to have these three properties. First and most importantly, it has to be consistent with the null hypothesis value. Second, and equally as important, it needs to use the data from the original sample. And then third, what I think is just as important, but maybe not quite as important, is that it tries to reflect the way in which the original data was collected. So if you have an experimental design, you really, um, where you randomly assign the labels to your subjects, your randomization distribution should use that randomization, um, should, should randomly assign those labels to the subjects. If you used a design that didn't involve that, that was maybe a correlational study, then maybe it makes sense to use a, a design where you're kind of sampling with replacement. And your book sort of goes through these differences. And I think these are really important ideas to understand, but I think uh, 
uh, understanding the differences between all of them is not important for success in this course as well as success in understanding this material. And if you are interested in understanding a little bit more about this, I'd encourage you to read through section 4.5 very carefully. And then actually one of the problems you'll be working on for your homework that I would argue is a rather challenging problem, that problem will have you thinking about randomization distributions and whether or not the scenarios that are described will create valid randomization distributions. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is the connection between bootstrap distributions and randomization distributions. And to some extent, you can kind of think about this again as the relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Because bootstrapping is used for confidence intervals, randomization distributions are used for hypothesis testing. So these are the main two connections. When a sample statistic lies in the tail of a randomization distribution, this means that the value of the null hypothesis will lie in the tail of a bootstrap distribution. That means that it will be an implausible value for the population parameter, which is analogous to rejecting your null hypothesis value. When a sample statistic lies in the middle of a randomization distribution, this means that the value of the null hypothesis will lie in the middle of a bootstrap distribution. This means that your null hypothesis value is a plausible value for your population parameter. It means you should expect a large p-value, and it means you will fail to reject your null hypothesis. So after today's class, we're moving on beyond these simulation-based approaches, and we will start talking about normal distributions. And then once we're done with normal distributions, we're going to start moving into t-distributions and talking about t-tests. So we are again now sort of going through a period in the class where we're going to experience a change. So we learned about describing data at the beginning part of the class as well as study design. Then we've talked about these simulation-based approaches for confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. And now we're going to talk about formula-based approaches for confidence intervals and hypothesis testing.